Hi, everyone. Seems to be working. Hi, welcome. It got very quiet in the room, so I'm going to take that as my cue to begin. Um, super happy to see all of you and oh, getting a little feedback, maybe. Um, my name is Ann Elgood. I am the Good Works Executive Director of ICLA, and we are thrilled to welcome you today for the opening of the condition of being addressable. Um, this is a show that is guest curated by my friends here on the panel, Legacy Russell and Marcel Joseph. You should all have on your chairs their bios. So rather than spend time going through their very impressive histories and the many things they've accomplished, I'm going to let you read those so that we can kind of jump right into the conversation. Um, but briefly, Marcel is an independent curator based in London, and Legacy is the executive director and chief curator at The Kitchen in New York City. The invitation to curate this show at ICLA came from our former senior curator, Jamila James, who is unfortunately not able to travel from Chicago to be with us here today. But I want to acknowledge her incredible curatorial work at ICLA over the past five years before her recent departure and her um, foresight and really great support for colleagues in the field which is represented by the invitation to Legacy and Marcel to curate the show. So as Legacy would put it, I want to call Jamila into the room and acknowledge her and acknowledge everything she's done for this institution. We miss you, JJ, if you're listening. That's and true. you're That's here true. with us in spirit. Yes. I also want to acknowledge ICALA's curatorial assistant, Caroline Liu, who's here somewhere for all her hard work working with Legacy and Marcel to realize this exhibition. Our head of, exhi of exhibitions and our head designer and chief preparator, Peter Gould, who is maybe here somewhere. Peter and uh, the incredible team of art handlers um, are so talented and so conscientious and did a beautiful job installing this show. I want to acknowledge them and their work. And I really want to acknowledge every staff member at the ICALA, all of whom played a role in some way or another in bringing this exhibition to life and to the open house that's happening today. There are a lot of exciting programs happening in relationship to the condition of being addressable. You all have another yellow, like almost like looks like a um, bookmark somewhere on your chair or in the front where you can read all about the programs that are coming up, both related to the show and to um, other projects. These are organized by our Director of Learning and Engagement, Asuka Hisa, who is here, and her uh, program assistant, Isabella Parlamas. So uh, grateful to them for all of their work putting these programs together. There'll be a lot of, I think, fascinating conversations connected to the exhibition over the summer. The genesis for the condition of being addressable was over six years ago, and after various COVID-related delays that we've all experienced in our lives, it's really an honor and a real pleasure to see this exhibition come to life. Um, it brings together 25 international and intergenerational artists who, whose works explore bodies and exposure and the ever-evolving performance of language. Um, we'll talk a lot today about the idea of the body as a site of address and what that means and the various ways that that can operate in the work. Uh, these artists also interrogate power relations and the dynamics that impact subjectivity through race and sexuality and gender and, in, and the limits of language, both spoken and written and um, how artists are sort of grappling with that in their work, as well as the imperative and the agency for constructing self-image and representation. So without further ado, I have a lot of questions for these two. And the first one is simply, how did you meet? How did you come together to organize this exhibition? Yeah, so Legacy and I met in 2016, um, as Anne mentioned, that's six years ago. Um, <laughs> Uh, we met through a mutual artist friend um, who was in our shared artist community in London. Um, at that time, Legacy was living and working in London, um, and I've lived in London for the, um, the, the last 28 years. Um, so Legacy and I got together, we met up, we hashed out ideas um, about a, sh a show about identity. Um, we you know, thought about what artists we could include. Um, and then Legacy uh, proposed the epigraph from Claudia Rankine's Citizen to under, underpin the exhibition, and that's sort of when it all came together. Um, 
So that's how it all started back in 2016 in London. There you have it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, um, I'm a big advocate for collaboration and I have collaborated with other curators on uh, curating exhibitions and it's, you know, it's very different than doing it on your own. And I know, um, you know, I think firsthand some of the deep conversations and how, how exhibitions can actually really change and evolve through those conversations. So we'll get into that mm -hmm. a little bit more in a minute. But um, Legacy, can you just talk about the origin of, really the origin story of the show? You know, what were the ideas and the, the issues that you wanted to examine in bringing the show together? I mean, I think there's, there's so much that has occurred over the last six years of just reflecting on how this show can come to be. And, and I think there was a, a, someone who actually asked a couple of days ago how many folks were originally envisioned to be part of this exhibition. And, um, you know, I think there were versions of this that probably could have been three times its size, right? And then also versions of it which were much more intimate. Um, I think the ways in which we wanted this to work was to have it kind of defy chronology and to allow for there to be a different type of representation inside of an institutional site. Um, you know, I'm someone who's coming from museum spaces and thinking deeply about institutional life and what it means to, to kind of um, have aspects of that be at points quite weighty in terms of a curatorial lens um, and an institutional lens inside of how artists are represented and brought together in, in just the process of exhibition making. So, you know, to think about this word, I would say, like, to kind of call into to the room the um, idea of decolonizing things, right? Like, this is a term I know that, like, a lot of us use, answer to, um, try to define, right, but has of course continued to surge over these past years, from, especially from 2020 to present. And, you know, as a, a curator who engages in institutional practice, I think one of the things that I have reflected deeply about is that part of the decolonial work that one can do um, as an agent of change inside of these different spaces is to ask questions about why it is that certain artists are not brought into conversation with each other in exhibition making. Um, so, you know, what was really remarkable as Marcel and I reflected on these artists is that, you know, for us it felt quite logical that these are folks across different generations and backgrounds and perspectives, but um, really share a commonality and asking very similar questions through time. Um, yet many of these artists are showing for the first time together ever in this show. Um, and that is just, I think, um, something that speaks to the challenge of producing exhibitions and having this idea of a kind of thematic lens be something that can be quite heavy handed. Um, so Marcel and I you know, thought about what it meant to, if we let go of this idea of uh, everything being purely thematic and deeply chronological, right? That actually the way in which history works is that um, it has a million different entry points and um, moves backwards and forwards um, at the same time. That, you know, what would it look like to have an exhibition that could do that kind of work? Um, and I think that, you know, the artists were really excited about that because, you know, for those especially who are in the room, I think Mary Kelly is here somewhere. Yes, Mary. Um, you know, it's, I think it's been really nice to, to talk to folks, you know, now in physical space, but also over the past six years, you know, having many email chains and phone conversations um, where folks expressed a great desire, right, to be um, in a kind of space of convening and to share space inside of this project. So um, for us, that was something that was kind of a primary motivator and driving force behind this framework. You just mentioned so many things that we're going to definitely come back to. Um, I want to read the epigraph that inspired the title of the exhibition aloud because I just want to bring it into the room, especially for those who haven't been able to go into the galleries yet. Um, it's from Claudia Rankin's you know, remarkable book, Citizen, an American Lyric from 2014. And it reads, not long ago you were in a room where someone asked the philosopher Judith Butler, what makes language hurtful? You can feel everyone lean in, which I'm doing right now, I'm leaning into this microphone. <laughs> Our very being exposes us to the address of another, she answers. We suffer from the condition of being addressable. So just as Carmen asked you a little bit earlier, I wanna unpack this idea of being addressable a bit. This exhibition feels incredibly timely and I think it's you know, grappling with very current understandings of the relationship between the body and language um, and the ways in which being addressable is both an imperative and also a kind of vulnerability. So I'd love for you to talk about this idea of being addressable and also touch upon what you started to touch upon, Legacy, which is 
How has that exploration, that sort of cornerstone of the exhibition, changed over time since you have been working on it for six years? And I'm sure your ideas about it have actually you know, changed in, in significant ways, and maybe not, and maybe in some ways that those core um, explorations are still there. So any way you want to tackle that question. Yeah, I just want to um, maybe start out to say we really wanted to look at the broadest possible interpretation of, uh, of identity and work with a cross-generational group of artists that were, um, you know, pursuing issues around race, gender, and class. And finding this quote in Claudia Rankine's long-form poem, Citizen, was really a godsend because it's a quote within a quote. Um, so um, it's quoting Judith, Judith Butler. Um, the fe feminist and queer theorists. So it's allowed us as curators to find artists whose works touch on post-colonial theory, feminist theory, queer theory, and an intersection of all those theories. Um, so it was, I think it was, I mean, it was just a godsend to find this epigraph and, and also to use the epigraph to answer to as we chose each artist. Um, to really um, ask yourself what a certain work does in an exhibition and how does it answer to this, this su subject matter, the epigraph of being addressable um, and claiming um, you know, agency and power. Um, um, and yeah, so in terms of the epigraph and the quote, um, I mean, I, I want to thank Legacy because she introduced me to Claudia Rankine's Citizen. Uh, so I have to, her to thank for um, sharing with me this seminal text um, that takes the form of a long form poem. Um, my academic expertise is in feminist theory, um, so I was super excited to bring Judith Butler into the room um, as um, she's a big hero of mine. And in her best known works, Gender Trouble and, and um, Bodies That Matter, she opens out gender in such an inclusive way, um, bringing in trans and non-binary folks um, into the realm of feminist theory um, and introducing um, art historians and academics to this new, you know, area of study, queer theory. Um, so this quote within a quote really allowed our exhibition to include all these wonderful artists um, across the racial and gender spectrums. I, I really, I think it's also um, useful to like reflect on as well that in, and Marcel, I hope you don't mind me saying, but um, it's useful to think through the fact that we are different generations as well. So it's, it is, you know, as someone who um, is, is growing in one's curatorial practice and thinking deeply about you know what it means to come from different generations of feminisms, right, um, and different questions that we ask inside of uh, kind of like a political arc. Uh, the part of the work of doing this project was you know kind of walking toward one another by choice, right, and thinking through how those things you know can be a part of our discourse that drives this project um, as an exhibition. It also I think is really um, you know, important to think through again what Claudia Rankin does by bringing Judith Butler inside of a text in a text, right? Because um, oftentimes, again, the way in which institutionalized space and thinking about how things are schooled, right, in a kind of academy sense, um, the, the sort of syllabi of things will, you know, historically sometimes keep um, race and gender and class as, as almost different types of, of uh, sites to, to occupy and to study. Um, and what really I think is important is that, you know, gender is a, a race and class material race is a gendered and classed material, right? So these are things that kind of go in concentric circles um, with each other, and it feels really important to allow for there to be a shared space um, in reflecting on not only, of course, this moment in the world, right, but the histories that really are brought into the room across the various artists that are in this amazing exhibition. Because, you know, each of them, of course, are thinking a lot about this question of address as being, um, you know, an expansive material um, and one that is, you know, really bound up in uh, many different types of definitions, but certainly, too, in that kind of, um, you know, concentric circle, right, that they're actually sharing uh, in that. Venn diagram, right? A kind of crossover of theory and thought um, and practice and history. You know, it strikes me, we've turned a, a fair amount of the sound down for the talk and we'll turn all the sound back on uh, for you to experience the exhibition. But as you go through, there are literally artworks speaking to each other. Mm -hmm. There are voices that are intentionally by the curators left in the room to kind of interrupt each other in a way and, and certainly be in dialogue. And, and now it strikes me that you have that embedded in the epigraph, the way that Butler and Rankin are actually in dialogue with one another and kind of speaking to each other in the same way that you experience physically in the exhibition. So that's a really nice um, 
I think, installation choice on your part. I mean, usually curators, we spend all this time trying to control sound, um, which, you know, in this building is really difficult. <laughs> so in a way, you know, the fact that that's part of, you know, what's embedded in your installation design, it, it works really well in our building, but also it's, it's really refreshing to me that there isn't this effort to sort of make everything controlled and contained, that that um, kind of infection across borders is, is happening in the space in a productive way. Um, so I wanna talk a bit about the politics of representation and specifically the um, construction of self-image and, and you know, having the authority and the platform in which to present self. So I thought it might be fun to talk about that by using a few examples in the show. So do you each wanna talk about one or two artists for whom that's key to the work? Sure. Um, I would like to talk about Zadie Chaw's work. Um, if you haven't seen it already, um, the title of the work is Fish Scales and Poisonous Darts. Um, it was made in 2016. Um, and Zadie is a first generation Canadian artist um, born to Korean parents. Um, the reason I mention these biographical facts is that the artist explores um, her experience in the Korean diaspora through her own artistic practice that sort of sits on the intersection of art, fashion, and design. Um, and textile, textiles are a key part of um, Zadie's practice. Um, and these textile works often take the form of garments and cloaks that are then um, activated in performance, moving image, and, and installation. Um, w when thinking about fashion, I often think about shape shifting where you can put on a garment and become someone else for the day. Um, and when Zadie was growing up in, um, in, in Canada, in Vancouver, um, she was really, you know, she was trying to assimilate to North American culture. And at that time in the 90s, she was really inspired by hip hop culture. The music, the clothes, the attitude, the swagger. Um, so in this work that you'll see um, in the show, um, you can see, kind of see it as a patchwork quilt of all these references um, from the fabrics used, um, stonewashed denim, leather, camouflage, um, artificial hair extensions, um, and the oversized jacket that's sort of contained within this um, work. Um, and then layered on top of this jacket, you have all these um, symbols um, from her Korean diasporic identity like um, East Asian yin and yang symbols, um, the number seven, which is a lucky number in Korean culture and just happens to be one of the artist's favorite numbers. Um, and then you have these domestic kitchen knives um, sort of qu quilted on top of this um, jacket that, that reference um, sort of Korean domestic kitchens. Um, um, you would use these big um, cooking knives to descale fish or to slice beef for Korean barbecue. Um, and then also she's even included um, a little bit of text on the top of the jacket. Um, it's a moniker that she used to call herself many years ago. Um, so in this Asian inspired font at the top of the jacket um, are the words, young yellow princess. Um, so yeah, I think this, this amazing textile work functions um, as a self image. Um, bringing in her lived experience, uh, the assimilation strategies of immigrant culture, um, and, you know, and her own Korean diasporic identity. So creating this vibrant work um, loaded with meaning around representation. Just as a side note, um, if any of you folks get up to San Francisco in the next month or two, um, her work is in uh, a two-person show at the Jessica Silverman Gallery um, alongside that of the painter Hernan Boss. Yeah. I mean, I'll take a kind of um, broader view in, in thinking about uh, some of the ways in which the artists in the show set forward different uh, sort of strands of, of maybe questions, right, or inquiry, um, but perhaps to begin with um, Sandra Perry as a root there. So the work that is in the show um, is a really special work. It actually was originally shown at the kitchen um, in an exhibition called Resident Evil. Um, and this was a, a show that Sandra did very early in her practice. It um, you know, engages language, I would say, you know, sort of visually that now for folks who have followed her work and seen her grow over time 
might feel quite familiar. But at the time, right, this was like a really immense moment because Sandra was kind of breaking out into thinking deeply about installation and continuing to kind of embolden her research by bringing different histories into the room. So, you know, what you're seeing in this exhibition is, a, you know, it's literally a, a exercise bike. Um, and, you know, the, the hot secret that we'll let you into is that actually it, you know, is technically supposed to be sat on. Um, so, you know, Sandra wants us to be asking about the, the what machinic practice can do, right, and how machines are proxies to bodies, um, and also can be, of course, um, materials that assert a certain idea about what a body should look like and um, who we need to become, right, so they're kind of transformation tools. So, you know, to draw between, you know, Zadie Cha and thinking about this question of what it means to put something on and kind of have that exist in alchemy, that it literally changes your form, right? In Sandra's case, Sandra's pushing us to think about, you know, what does it mean when we are connecting with this machine and that, you know, these machines are proxies to our cultural fantasies in ways that actually can be, you know, incredible and exciting and also terrifying and, you know, deeply problematic. Um, so, you know, the way in which Sandra has brought um, herself into the room is kind of in this proxy form. Um, you know, we're seeing if you don't sit on the bike because it's quite delicate, but, um, you know, if we imagine through Sandra's fantasy, right, that you put on the headphones, which certainly you are allowed to touch, um, and you spend time with the work, um, you're meeting Sandra, actually, even though Sandra is not in the room. Um, so there is this kind of avatar as a material, right, that um, becomes a really sticky trope, because certainly reflecting on this question of black womanhood um, and what it means to disassociate as a black body, right, um, as a queer body, as a gendered body, right, I'm kind of extending in different directions as we look in a broader arc across all of the artists that are in the show. Um, you know, I think that there is something that's really important about um, allowing for this question of what closes the space of this kind of in-between, that hyphenate, right, and how actually there can be immense agency in having something stand, um, you know, in artifice, in, in replacement of you, even if you are not able to be there. Um, but also at the same time, I think Sandra is very rigorously asking us to think about machinic relationships across race, class, and gender, um, and certainly, too, the extractive relationship of capitalism as of course it you know is deeply embedded in our American culture and black histories so you know it feels apt to to have that be a work um, that maybe we turn attention to because of course there is so much that is hyper um, uh, visible and also as well um, hyper complicated uh, inside of what the material of the work is right and this idea of the machine as a kind of conceptual prompt becomes something that we see across multiple works in the show um, I think technology in many ways is always in the room. Uh, and then the question is really how do the artists make use of it to express different perspectives? Yeah, I <clears throat> excuse me. <coughs> I'm a little coughing fit over here. Um, I think building on the idea of machine and technology, maybe we could talk a bit about <clears throat> surveillance as mm -hmm. um, one of the topics in the show as well. and. The idea of being profiled, as you put it earlier, <clears throat> excuse me, legacy. Thank you. <laughs> of course. <coughs> so um, again, maybe t touching on specific pieces in the show, you could talk about this as one of the subjects that I think is also related to a larger subject around visibility or invisibility, and in some ways, the kind of risk of visibility or the ways in which you know, visibility can also make someone become a target, especially in those instances where they're being profiled or where they're perceived as being someplace they don't belong or are questioned in some way. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. Um, maybe we could talk about um, surveillance through the work, um, the video work of Imran Peretta, um, who is a London-born um, artist. Um, um, and we're showing here his uh, video, Brother to Brother, um, which is based largely on his own experience of returning from a residency in, in Bangladesh and being detained um, at London Heathrow Airport for several hours. Um, and in the video, he uses his own, his own body. He's the pr protagonist in the video. So you see this um, very vulnerable um, male presenting body with a black cloak over his head. Um, and it's, it's very disturbing. It's, um, it's just, it's all about surveillance and especially um, a male presenting brown body, um, a Muslim body. There's all these things that go into this work um, that 
yeah, it really make, makes you start to think about um, surveillance and, and being profiled and, and how vulnerable that is and how do you render yourself addressable? Do you make yourself smaller? Do you try to become invisible? Um, but then when you're out there on the street, you're hyper visible. Um, and especially, um, I think Imran started to think more and more about this um, after September 11th. Um, sort of the world changed for him when he was out and about in public. Um, so yeah. Yeah, and I think like it's it's interesting, especially to um, keep uh, reflecting on Imran's work, that inside of the work, what is super striking to me is that how ordinary objects become extraordinarily violent. And it makes me, of course, think about, you know, folks like Elaine Scarry, who's written a beautiful book many years ago called The Body in Pain. But, you know, it's this, like, uh, idea of having a, a chair basically become an object of torture, right? So, um, you know, we see that inside of the work uh, that, you know, Imran is sharing with us that it's a, you know, a material that kind of is documenting an experience that is deeply personal, deeply private, actually. You know, the idea of kind of having that space be sealed um, and to not know really what the outcome might be, right? But then, you know, having to recreate it as a, a you know, kind of uh, material of politic and also really um, of kind of investigation, right? Um, in Imran's case, you know, allowing for that to become a work that has many lives that continues to kind of play and replay um, into space, right? Makes it something that, you know, really can't be forgotten, right? And in that way too, right? We share in that experience a memory with him. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about language. Um, of course, this idea of the address of how the body is part of the process of the address, but also really specifically how the artists are using language. It's uh, walking through the show, I, I have been quite struck by the different forms of language that enter into the work. So there's a video that is a kind of video essay that takes you through um, you know, a narrative of sorts with, with subtitles. There is poetry that's embedded in some of the work. Um, as Marcel just described, there's there's language into some of the, the objects, and there's also captioning that's uh, performed in a really interesting way in the Lorna Simpson piece. So just wanted you to have an opportunity to talk about that, and maybe if, in some sense, you might have been looking for works that deployed language in specific ways as you were thinking about artists for the show. I mean, I think in some ways, like, it kind of happened not, well, intentionally, but accidentally, in that, you know, we were looking at the artists and, you know, their practices and thinking about how they could share space together. But then what was, I think, kind of amazing as we continued in our work and research was that there were many folks who were using language, literally thinking about what do words do, and then what are the ways in which actually different types of maybe more somatic memory can be impact, um, and that, you know, that to the point of the visual essay, right, that, like, that there can be different types of language, right, and how those things are carried um, and kind of transmitted can take on different forms. So, you know, I think it's really, um, uh, amazing, for example, to think about with, in the case of Lorna's work, um, that this is a work that, you know, as I've sat with it, it, it is a cinematic work. It, you know, exists almost as a moving image, even though, of course, it's a series of still photographs. And um, also, it's a work that, you know, brings quite literally into the, the language of it um, questions about the history of film um, and the ways in which, of course, um, different types of portraiture can be represented. Um, so, you know, there are parts of this that I think are, are almost intended to exist kind of as fractured material. They, you know, are a single work, right, but also in many ways um, many individual works that can be read in different directions. And I feel, you know, to the point of language across the, the broader show that that kind of is the case with all of these different, um, you know, kind of points of entry, thinking of, of Miata Quincy's work and Hannah Block's work, uh, the way that the words actually are, are put into motion show us all different points of departure for how language actually sometimes can fail completely, and then really the ways in which the artists themselves become the engineers of new language and new thought. Yeah, um, thinking about language, I mean, a lot of the works do have text embedded in them. Um, and But then, like, I'm, I'm thinking kind of of Mary Kelly's um, letter, um, Athena Papadopoulos. Um, she has the words, hoochie mama, and all these um, sort of textual words that connote this sort of excessive, indulgent femininity. But, and then these two works, there's also the material language. 
um, Mary Kelly's Beirut 1970 is um, made with lint from a domestic clothes dryer. So she's constructing this work that takes the form of a letter. So the entire um, uh, work is, is text. But this material language of lint really sort of embeds itself and talks about the sort of the unrelenting rhythms of domestic labor. And then on Thena pa Papadopoulos' side, um, I mean, even her titles are, are, are amazing, as um, I think Anne pointed out. Um, I don't remember it exa exactly, but I know cesspit and boogie woogie are in the title. But um, the, the material language of Athena's work, um, using a, a bed sheet instead of canvas, and instead of paint, using lipstick, nail polish, uh, hair dye, um, all these um, implements that a woman would use when you know going out for a night of revelry to sort of perform this um, yeah excessive femininity. So it's interesting how the text and the material language can kind of go hand in hand. And it's also I think it's like quite neat. You know, when we think about the work of, of Judy Chicago and the series that's presented in this show, that there's also writing and language even in a place where there are no words. So you know, it's quite immense to think about you know, what Judy Chicago is doing with that work, literally going out into the middle of nowhere and having that space be transformed in the choreography of its practice, right? Um, so you know, I, I think to the question, right, it's great to have these moments where um, you kind of are seeing things in these various layers and as well that you know, there have been these kind of strange um, happenstances across the different works as we've now installed them and really seen them in their sight that they almost feel like that they've been in dialogue all along. And that I think also is a really wonderful thing to see because again, it speaks to the possibilities of being um, in conversation, right? Rather than having one's practice or generation kind of siloed and set apart from one another. Okay, a couple more questions and I'm gonna open it up. Um, you know, there's been so much work in the last, especially decade or so, I would say, to kind of uncover artists that we feel are underrepresented and have not really been given their visibility. And oftentimes that takes the form of artists who um, are further along in their careers, let's say. So many older artists have come into visibility, I think, in really powerful and meaningful ways. So it's noteworthy that the older artists in your exhibition, in fact, are not that at all. I would say they're actually icons. So you have Mary Kelly. Again, let's give a little round of applause. <laughs> um, who's not only a hugely influential artist, but an, a very, very important teacher and member of the community here in Los Angeles. Judy Chicago, um, Anna Mendieta, who's the only, you know, yeah, let's keep, let's keep going. <laughs> Anna Mendieta is the only artist who's no longer with us, unfortunately. Um, and then Lynn Hirschman Neeson, who of course completely changed the way that we think about technology and how it operates. So um, the intergenerational dialogue that you're creating in the show I know is so important. And I just wanted to ask you, you know, why did you want to make sure that these m more established artists were of that sort of visibility and to put them in conversation with these younger artists? Yeah. I would say that there's um, also, Lubaina Hamid is also in the show, so we can all clap for her. Lubaina as well, um, I have to say. Oh yeah, that's, and Lorna, that's my rock star. we can say Lorna too. Yes, uh, yes, exactly, and Lorna Simpson, absolutely. So, you know, just, I think, again, there are many um, amazing rock stars that are in this show, and I guess I was actually talking about this with Mary the other evening, is the ways in which, as we spoke to artists, because of course, six years of time for a younger artist um, means something in a certain way, right? Like a lot of things happened with artists that began six years ago in terms of their practices um, that you know their practices have changed and evolved in all of these exciting ways um, since we began conversations with them so it's been an immense privilege to be able to be part of that but also I think you know we often um, kind of uh, almost pathologize the mythology of uh, a younger artist being the, the, the um, the identity that has that transformation be possible, right? That you have to be a young person to be able to go through those different stages of growth and and um, and kind of expansion in one's practice. And you know what we've seen too, of course, in these past six years is that there also have been these amazing moments of recognition for these incredible artists who you know are already you know the most amazing artists in our cultural imagination, right? So I think it's this um, 
really important thing to have these folks um, be in dialogue across now what almost felt like a you know kind of durational <laughs> performance in its own right having this show come into being across such an extended period of time um, and then also too to think about what you know what it meant to speak to some of the the artists who are younger artists in the show and and to say you know like speaking to EJ the other day you were in the room with Mary Kelly and Lynn Hirschman Leeson um, and Labena Himid and you know Anna Mendieta and and what does that mean to you know be able to have a uh, kind of calling into space with these other folks who um, in many different types of projects, right, maybe um, a younger artist might not have the direct access point to or be able to exhibit alongside of. And, you know, I think that it has been this really tender experience to see that, you know, come into being. And also as well, I think a great opportunity for folks in the exhibition who are younger folks to see uh, the arc of a career, right, really that has been hard fought um, and that, you know, has allowed for there to be this next generation and generation generations after that even come into being and be possible. So, you know, again, having these different um, sightings of, of practice and, you know, as well of kind of pedagogy, I think it allows there to be this um, really neat exchange, mm -hmm. for sure, to the point of address and, and the show's framework, too. Yeah, for me as a curator, uh, one of my favorite devices to employ um, in an exhibition is to present artistic voices from the past alongside um, those from the present and sort of um, find commonalities across time. Um, and one of my favorite sort of cross-generational dialogues in the show is um, being able to have um, Anna Mendieta's um, Silhouetta in Mexico series work that was made in the 1970s. Um, and that's the, um, the photographic earth work where you, see, where you see the red imprint left in the earth from the artist's body. So we have that work next to Tiana McClaudin's um, 2016 selfie photograph, um, and which was made at the time when she was on residency in Iowa, which is Mendieta's home state, um, where she was raised as a, uh, as a child and um, studied art as a young artist um, after she immigrated from Cuba. And McClaudin was in um, Iowa in 2016 to actually study the archive of Mendieta. So now we have in this show these two works side by side. So I think that's, um, yeah, it's, it's an amazing dialogue. Um, and it's, you know, looking at the, um, the absent, raced, and gendered body in both cases. It's looking at visibility, hypervisibility. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm loving all the cross generational dialogues in the show. And I also, I will say, like, it's, it's, um complex and important to note too that there are artists who are grappling with themes that you know other artists were grappling with 40 years ago right so um you know to the point of mary kelly's work the the kind of framework of motherhood and domesticity and thinking about you know certainly um you know to the work of of um anna mendieta right asking questions about what it means um to you know engage in in different types of erasure right as a latinx person um so you know these are things that that uh feel really necessary in terms of the kind of Torch that's being carried on across generations, um, and thinking about too that you know to the point of progress, right? That the linearity of the exhibition is not the point, right? That actually um, things have not moved in a straight line, and certainly there have been moments too where there have been um, hard-won victories that certainly in this moment of history now, right, continue to be eroded. So it's really I think an important time to reflect on how the different thresholds of history can become kind of bent and, and made more permeable um, in the practices of each of these artists. Thank you. I want to open it up, but before I do, um, we're here celebrating the condition of being addressable. We want to focus on that, but I know everyone will be curious to hear a little bit about what you have coming up. Do you want to just tell us about one or two exciting things in your future? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm working on a, another large group exhibition in the UK um, with British curator um, uh, Becca Pelly Fry. Um, it's a show that pairs nine feminist artists working in the 70s and 80s with a, a younger contemporary artist. So again, you can see that I like these cross-generational dialogues. Um, and coincidentally, we're using an epigraph from Judy, uh, Ju uh, Judith Butler's um, Bodies That Matter. Um, it will open in February 2023 um, at Giant, which is this not-for-profit contemporary art space along the Dorset coast um, of the UK um, in Bournemouth. Um, the artist list isn't, isn't fully finalized, but um, there will be works from the likes of Carolee Schneemann, 
uh, Nikki Dasan Fall, Helen Chadwick, um, and Penny Slinger, who is actually here in the audience today. Um, so yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm also um, starting, um, I'm working on the beginning stages of a new residency um, with my collecting partner in the Girl Power Collection. Um, so we're looking at how that's going to take shape um, and it will, the initial sort of test, test residency will take place um, in May of next year um, in rural France. So watch the space. I am the executive director and chief curator of The Kitchen, as I'm sure some of you know. And for those of you who are new to The Kitchen, The Kitchen is a leading experimental art space that's been running since 1971. So uh, when I returned to New York, um, which I can't believe is tomorrow, I'm so sad this week is over. But um, you know, I am kind of pivoting back into what is the visioning work of this next chapter of the institution. We're in the process of kind of uh, reimagining what an experimental mission can be and what it can do for artists across generations. So, you know, we are kind of relaunching the program. We've already had some really exciting projects that have opened since the beginning of the year to present with Sadie Barnett, with Madison Moore, with E. Jane, um, you know, some amazing folks who kind of have shared space in, in allowing for this next chapter to kind of become an investigation of how the mission can be pushed further. And then also I'm working on my second book. So that's something that I'm really looking forward to, to completing and sharing with you all. Very exciting. We are doing a book club for Legacy's first book of Glitch Feminism, so please join our book club. I'm going to do it because... I might have to do it too. I think she's going <laughs> to pop in, so you <laughs> yeah. know that'll make it even more special to have her just show up and we can all feel you know, insecure about what we're going to say about her book. <laughs> so um, questions from the audience. Who has a question? Just raise your hand or shout it out. Oh, okay. We have a mic. So don't shout it out. <laughs> don't shout it out. We're recording, I think. <laughs> it's always hard to be the first question, but somebody's going to do it. I knew you would. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, guys, for this incredible show. I just felt like I wanted to hear a little bit more about being addressable. I felt like I didn't quite get to that with you, and so I just wanted to hear a little bit more about that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Love that question. Also great to see you in physical space. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think the, the, this was actually a question that, that um, has come up across the week and it's been really wonderful to reflect with all of the different audiences as they have experienced the show, this question of addressability, but also certainly to this question of a condition of addressability, right? Which um, almost suggests that it's something to be um, kind of uh, scourged or reconciled or healed, right, or sanitized. Um, and I think that to the point of what the exhibition is and, you know, this idea of uh, addressability as a speech act, as an utterance, as a calling out and calling in, um, as a naming, right, um, and then as a chosen naming, right, what does it mean to have all of the kind of projections of different types of address to grapple with and kind of uh, navigate and wayfind in the context of this as a project? So. Um, you know, the question of the condition of it, right, is something too that, that feels really important to kind of set into frame. And um, I feel, you know, as a, a co-organizer of this project that it certainly is not um, one that aims to uh, kind of reconcile this question of the condition, but rather to expand it, right, and to think through um, what does it mean to have, you know, Claudia Rankin, Judith Butler, but then also all the other immense voices that are in the room through and beyond their texts, and then the texts of all of the artists as they of course, have been um, working with us across these six years and these amazing works that are in the show um, to kind of have those many voices, as Anne said, in the room. So there's a kind of cacophony there, but there is something that I think feels really important too to not simplify or kind of sterilize what address can be, um, that it can be a radical political act, right, and a kind of reframing. It can also be something that, um, you know, as was mentioned in our recent walkthrough, right, can be, uh, you know, a wounding, right, and, you know, that too being something that, you know, is a sort of tender vulnerability. So there are these different layers inside of this address and the condition of that we really hope to expand. Oh, we have one, I think, back here, Isabella. Can you talk a little bit about this dichotomy of being addressable versus unaddressable and the conditions thereof? Hmm. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think um, 
the idea about being addressable um, when you're looking these when you're looking at these folks that have been othered or marginalized in society um, by the color of their skin, by their position on the gender spectrum, or some intersection of all of these things. Um, it's uh, how do these folks? How do they make space for themselves? How do they um, claim agency and, and power? Um, do they? How do they do the labor of representation? Um, I think a lot of the, the, the artists in, in, in the show are sort of looking at what does this look like, how does it play out, um, and I think it does play out across all of the works. Yeah, I mean, um, actually like a quote that I'll paraphrase from uh, amazing artist, poet, Manuel Arturo Abreu, um, has written uh, uh, many books uh, themselves, but uh, there's a line in particular that came into my head as you asked that question, which is this idea about existing as a hyperlink, and I'm kind of pra paraphrasing, but um, to the question of like this hyperlink, right, this um, notion of addressability and also of kind of failure of address um, is something that feels uh, really spiraled, I guess. You know, there's kind of many different points in which we um, kind of do and undo that work that it can be both harmful but also, you know, kind of ecstatic and, and as well thinking about what it means to seize the opportunity to, to sort of self-determine, right? What does it mean to name oneself and to create space of positive and generative address um, that is, you know, kind of part of a, a, a politic, right, of allowing for a different type of future to be built. So, um, you know, this question, too, of, you know, having each of these different presentations of art and of conversation, right, that it allows for there to be a discourse across that tension of, you know, addressability and also kind of uh, unaddressability. And, you know, with that, too, there being this space that exists kind of in hyperlink in between, right, like this question of, you know, what opens up, obviously, as we kind of click on that space and, and seeing, of course, that there are these different pathways to follow through the questions that the artists are asking. Hi. <laughs> um, I. So sort of two questions. The first was just that I'm new to the curating world and I was wondering how long it normally takes a show to come together since this one took six years. Um, <laughs> and then I was also wondering since it did take six years and that occurred over like a quote unquote universal pandemic experience, were there any questions, consistent que questions that newly emerged from all of the artists? Did you see them start to grapple with new ideas, like consistent new ideas across these different generations or identities? Um, well, welcome to curatorial work. I hope you are hanging on to your seat. Um, it is uh, an immense uh, responsibility and it's really wonderful, of course, to always meet uh, new curators who are doing exciting work. I would say that six years actually for an institutional curator is like not unusual. Um, and it's, you know, it is, there actually is another project that I just um, opened last year with Thomas J. Price in New York. And I would say that was a project that had a 10 year arc. So, you know, it is, um, it's like real endurance work, uh, a lot of different types of exhibition making. And I know that artists who are, in, many of whom in this room, understand that too, because there are moments where, as a curator, you meet somebody um, as an artist and they want to do a project and it cannot happen at any time. It has to happen at the time that the project needs to happen. Um, and that, I think, is also really difficult sometimes because at points almost you get so excited to you know, be in collaboration with phenomenal creative folks, um, but there's this kind of mutual understanding that you really want to make sure that it's uh, done with the care that it deserves, that it goes to the place that it needs to go, that, um, you know, that we are kind of to the point of address, putting the language to it, right, that really holds the artist front and center. So, um, you know, it can take years to create projects, and this pandemic, of course, like, made it even longer and, and stickier and more confusing, right, in terms of just how absolutely um, unhinged this period of time has been, right, in the world. But I also think that um, it is something that is patient work, regardless of whether there is a pandemic in, in the center of it. So, you know, for one who is kind of entering into this as a practice, right, it's about understanding that one has to go slowly and be prepared to go slowly to produce um, and to think and to provide that space, even despite the sort of deep acceleration of culture right now, which sometimes I think encourages us to think otherwise about how things need to exist. I would just add a short note. Um, when I started curating 12 years ago, um, I did it in a very DIY fashion. 
which is also something you could think about doing, where you actually, you want to do a show, you have a theme, you have artists you want to work with, you find a venue, and it is something that could be done in a much shorter period of time than six mm -hmm. years, mm -hmm. but. <laughs> but I mean, I think I, I totally agree, like, I, but this is what I guess I mean, is that the, the circumstances definitely dictate um, what the material is, right? So there are exhibitions and projects that sometimes do come about and actually are quite phenomenal to come about in a different type of framework and also outside of institutional spaces, right? We're inside of a museum space. In the kitchen's case, the kitchen's not a museum, right? The ways in which um, at points inside of its history, it's been able to really importantly skirt some of the um, challenges of speed, right? Um, and then the ways in which you know one can produce at different types of speed inside of different scales of institutions also feels really important right so um, yeah I think it's just it's it, it's useful to to understand too what it means to stand inside of an institution and do different types of work both at you know a clipped pace and also at points um, at a pace maybe that you know is a bit more expanded but the second part of your question was great can you repeat it I mean, I would say that there were artists who, like, and I'm sure, you know, in terms of, you know, Ann and Casper and Eve, like, these are folks who have grown up in six years. Like, you know, quite literally, they've, like, grown up in their practice. And um, I think that that has been such an immense privilege to be able to be a part of because they were in a very different chapter of their lives and career. And lots of amazing things have continued to kind of occur that they, at the point where we began in our conversations, maybe would not have even imagined as they projected themselves six years into the future. So um, to the point of questions that folks have asked, I think almost in many ways um, this exhibition and, and as well seeing it be possible, right, which I think also uh, has you know, been a great leap of faith for folks who saw many projects um, you know, stall and disappear and you know, to change form um, either forcibly or by choice because of the pandemic. Um, artists have really, I think, learned through the process of collaborating in this way, especially for folks who are not used to different types of institutional frameworks um, and who now actually are you know, learning through this exhibition and also the growth of their own practice and the questions they're asking, you know, what the systems of this work is. Uh, Jean, do you still have a question? I'll be quick. I know everyone's no, ready to have a drink. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for this talk. I was really, um, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about institutional critique and institutional transformation. And you know, you began with this idea of decolonization, which I think we're all, you know, kind of feeling, you know, urgently. How is that a politics that can also be a practice? And I love that you selected the Judy Chicago and Anna Mendieta works, the Earth works that are actually like facing each other on opposite walls. But you know, as urgent as we all kind of are grappling with these things, I like the selection of these reminding us that whether it was AIR or at feminist, you know, mm -hmm. art program, this work has been, you know, ongoing. And so I guess I just would love to hear you talk a little bit about how you see this ongoing transformation across decades of these institutional spaces kind of forging from within. I mean, I, I have a lot to say, as you know, about this. <laughs> I'm like, find me later. Um, but no, I, I will say, like, what are, what's maybe a, a brief way to address this in the time that we have? I, um, I think it is not possible to uh, exist in the world that we exist now and pretend that the world does not exist inside of institutions. So um, to the point of this, you know, the question of, of a decolonized model, right? I, I, was intentional in bringing that up because I think it is something that comes up again and again and folks are trying to figure out what does it mean as a slippy material, how can it be applied directly, and how can you see the results in it. And um, to the point of speed, right, or pacing, sometimes actually like these things take years and that is the reason why it is excruciating and devastating because as much as there are moments of progress inside of this practice, right, and things that um, folks have set out 
um, into being and possibility, right, that then we carry on in, in next generations. Um, also, there are moments of immense setbacks and disappointments and deep heartache inside of that. So I think institutional work is that, right? And I also think artwork is that, regardless of whether you're inside of an institution or not, um, largely because of the fact that the world continues to exist. And one of the um, things that I think has been really um, challenging but also important about this period of pandemic 2020 to present is that um, you know, our institutions can no longer pretend that we are set apart from the rest of the world. And so having to grapple with what feels like um, an influx of reality when the reality has always been there, right? Um, these are kind of fantasies and, and sort of fictions that we've created um, to allow for different types of canons to be built, right? Um, so it feels really um, exciting and, and also at points really challenging and triggering and all the things to ask questions about this point of future, right? Because the arc is long and there are things that, you know, I, I feel that as a curator now and as someone working with artists now, like when I speak to folks who are, you know, mentors and friends, um, they have had those same dilemmas and questions and frustrations and they, you know, for the last four decades, right? So um, sometimes these things change shape and form and don't disappear altogether, but it doesn't mean that the work doesn't progress and that it's not worth doing. Um, and so, you know, I think it's been really exciting to the point of ICA as being a part of this project because, you know, it has been a deep collaboration, not a simple work, right? And it also has been kind of deep co-conspirator work in many ways, right? Being able to sit down and talk to Jamila and to Anne and to Marcel and say, like, you know, what does it mean to bring artists together to have this kind of conversation in a point where there is so much um, that's happening in the world that, you know, makes it difficult sometimes to even function, right? So. So um, yeah, I think that that is the future, perhaps, right? Like, how do we set forward some of that, and also let it be complicated and being transparent about that too? Because when I sit down and speak to folks who are, you know, amazing interns and fellows and just beginning in the field, um, you know, it, I, I'm happy to talk to them about how it's hard. Um, it's hard work and it's exhausting sometimes too. But I think you know, artists in this show, right? I, I, doing the incredible work of allowing for different visions to be possible and, you know, to stay in, in the work um, across different chapters of life and experience and, and lived being. So, you know, that is what I think for me feels most, most urgent. What a beautiful note to end on. That was very inspiring. And if we all can, um, yeah. I think, you know, if, if you're here and if you're in the room, you're committed to the work, and I applaud all of you for that in whatever ways you're contributing. And I'm so grateful you're here. I want to congratulate Legacy and Marcel again on this thoughtful and I think very generative show. Please go enjoy it, have a drink, hang out with us. We're going to be here till at least 6 p.m., so thanks again for being here.